Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Nicole, and today I am thrilled to welcome Dr. Sheila Kilbane as my guest. Sheila and I have been friends for many years now, um, and she's absolutely one of the best pediatricians out there. Um, so I'm really excited that she's going to talk with us today. And I think one of the things that I most appreciate um, about her is the focus on root causes of childhood illness. Um, you know, so many kids who have emotional learning, behavioral developmental challenges also have many underlying physical issues that um, they're dealing with in terms of their health. And um, Dr. Kilbane really gets to the root of treating those things, which ultimately helps all of the behavioral and mental health issues improve too. Um, so Dr. Sheila Kilbane is a board certified pediatrician who has also trained in integrative medicine with Dr. Andrew Weil. She uses the best of traditional and integrative medicine to help families find the root cause of their child's illness. She walks families through her seven-step process to significantly improve or resolve altogether illnesses such as colic, reflux, eczema, recurrent ear and sinus infections, asthma, allergies, and stomach and GI issues like constipation, abdominal pain, celiac disease, Crohn's, and ulcerative colitis. Um, and I know many of you are ticking off that list in your mind as I'm reading that because you have kids who have many of those symptoms. Um, in addition to seeing individual patients in her unique clinic in Charlotte, North Carolina, she also gives educational lectures to parents and healthcare professionals. And if you don't live in North Carolina and don't have access to an integrative pediatrician in your area. Dr. Kilbane has written a book and has an online course to help you resolve your child's illness using her step-by-step -step approach. Welcome to the show, Dr. Kilbane. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Dr. Birkins. It's so, I'm so happy to be here. And as you and I have spoken, all of what we do overlaps so much that, you know, I list all those physical symptoms, but so many of the kids that I see have many of the symptoms that you see also in your practice and this nutrition approach and functional medicine, integrated medicine approach is just such a great tool for all of us to have. Absolutely. And I love that there are pediatricians like you out there doing this work because you're the kind of physician that mental health practitioners like me and my colleagues need to interface with to really get true holistic integrative care for patients, right? Especially for these kids with more complicated mental health or neurodevelopmental kinds of issues, we're not just dealing with stuff going on with their brain. Almost always there are things going on in the body that are connected to that. So I would love for you to just share with our listeners as a starting point, how did you fall into doing this kind of work? I mean, not only being in pediatrics, but what led you to sort of make the shift from more conventional um, pediatrics to the more integrative work that you're doing now? Yeah, so shortly out of residency, I realized I was prescribing steroids and antibiotics and medication after medication, and the kids would get better for two weeks, and then we would stop the medication, and they would get sick again two weeks later. And so all when you, when you understand this functional medicine world, I didn't understand it at the time, but we were just keeping their symptoms and their inflammation at bay for a couple of weeks, and then they would get sick again. And so I was seeing the same families every month, and they were the families that had that list of illnesses that you just read off. And the moms would look at me and go, isn't there something else we could do? And I would say, oh, I, don't, I don't think so. And so then I started reading and started to understand that what a huge role nutrition played. Mm -hmm. And now even when I give talks, I have this picture of a big elephant sitting in the middle of the room. And that's what I talk about food in the conventional medical world because we don't get any training on it. And so I just started little by little, I would do a selective elimination diet with families. So maybe we would take one food group out of the child's diet and it was like magic. So the physical symptoms would start melting away, but not only that is they would start sleeping better, their moods would be better, their ADHD symptoms would improve. And so I thought it had to be a fluke. And so I didn't really talk openly about it. And even my partners at that time, you know, this was years ago, but my mm -hmm. partners would say to me, what's that voodoo medicine you're doing, Sheila? <laughs> Yes. And yep, then, you know, a, a year later, they would come to me and say, what's the dose of those probiotics, Sheila? Uh -huh. you know, 
what should I do with this patient? And so it was, and that's how I, for many years, because I didn't want to rock the boat, I didn't want to be looked at that crazy pediatrician who talked mm -hmm. about food, which when you really think about it, food is, you know, food is everything, right? So it, that, it gave me so many more tools in my toolbox and it made practicing so much more fun again. And I really, there's never, there was never anything else I wanted to do but medicine. Mm -hmm. And the frustration that I felt right out of residency, I was miserable. Mm -hmm. And so things had to change for me or I was going to have to change careers. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's been phenomenal ever since then. And it's so much fun to come to work every day and get to make these changes with people who have been specialist to specialist to specialist and we get to come in and really say okay we're going to look at your whole family the dynamics the stress what are we eating we're going to look at the gut microbiome and we just get to make these really profound improvements and it's just extraordinarily satisfying so great and it that your story you know mirror so much of my story too, you know, from, from the mental health side of like, okay, we're trained to do these things. We're excited to do this. And then you get into the real world of practicing with people and you're like, oh, my box of tools isn't quite getting the results, you know, that I want to get. And when you have these tools that we're going to talk about, it just, it yeah. does, it makes this work so much more fun and rewarding because you actually see people really get better not just temporarily get better or not just sort of get a little bit better, but really see people get better. And it's interesting because you said, you know, you see people coming in for the physical stuff, right? My child's got ear infections all the time or constipation or whatever. You would treat, you know, with these approaches and then also their behavioral and, you know, neurological symptoms would get better. I see the same thing in reverse. People come to my office for help with, <laughs> focusing and you know managing their anxiety and behavior and those things I say okay we're gonna focus on that and by a side effect of that then their constipation and their ear infections and their eczema improve and I That's say what you need to move to Charlotte I know <laughs> <laughs> or you need to move to Grand Rapids one or the other uh, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah I know your weather's better for sure <laughs> um, <laughs> So let's talk about, so obviously there's this really, you know, strong connection between what's going on physiological health-wise for kids and what's going on with their brain development and, and function. But why don't, let's talk about why are there so many more chronic issues in kids these days in general? I mean, when we think about when we grew up, like, kids weren't sick all the time like they are now. We didn't have these chronic levels of things. So what's going on there in your opinion? Yeah, so 25, 30 years ago, it was maybe one in six or seven kids had a chronic issue. And today it's one in two. I yeah. mean, it's, the numbers are staggering. Mm -hmm. And I, from, from all of the research and studying I've done, I really think that we have changed our food supply so dramatically. and we have a lot more chemicals, herbicides, pesticides, cleaning products that we're putting, we're using in our homes, products that we're putting on our body, deodorant, you know, shampoos, lotions. And a couple of the big things are, I think are some of the herbicides that we use on our foods. Mm -hmm. And there's Roundup is a, a chemical that most people know. It is sprayed on certain crops, especially things like wheat, and it helps the farmers can turn the crops over more quickly if they're spraying at the end of the harvest. If they spray with this Roundup because it kills the crops quicker, they can combine them and harvest them. And then that, it, it gets absorbed by the by the part of the plant that we actually end up eating. Mm. And Roundup was originally patented as an antibiotic. And so what it does is it selectively goes in and it's killing 
the good, healthy bacteria in our gut. So things like the bifidobacterium, which is what we get from breastfeeding, the lactobacillus, which is what we get through the birth canal. And it's allowing the growth of some of the not so healthy bacteria, mm -hmm. things like E. coli, Clostridia. And those are bacteria that we need certain species of, mm -hmm. but there are certain species that we're getting an abundance of. And in my clinic, we do stool studies in a lot of the kids that we see. And it's a, it's a, a snapshot in time. It's, it's not a perfect study, but it's allowed me to look at the certain symptoms of the kids, what we're seeing in their gut, and how when we start to shift that, these symptoms really improve. Mm -hmm. And it's because even, even seven or eight years ago, we could just take dairy out of a child's diet, maybe put them on a probiotic, and their symptoms were. Mm -hmm. And now we're having to do a lot more work to get their guts back into balance and to resolve their symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so I really think that this, th these herbicides are playing a big role, and we have to know where our food is coming from, and we have to really look at what are we putting in our kids' bodies. And if we're doing wheat, corn, and soy, and they're not organic, you're gonna, the kids are gonna be exposed to these things. Mm -hmm. And so there are all sorts of tools and tips that we can talk about today about how to do it without breaking the bank. And mm -hmm. you know, the Environmental Working Group has mm -hmm. lists the, the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. So it's super doable. And that's what my intention for our, our talk today is that I want you to, to understand that you can make a few tweaks with your child and start to see improvements. It doesn't, you don't have to go down this very expensive route of changing absolutely everything, but if we make a few tweaks, you can start to really see a big difference. I totally agree, and I, I love that approach because sometimes this is really overwhelming. So parents go, okay, I understand this. I understand that, you know, Food is important. I, I understand what you're saying about the way that food is processed and chemicals and toxins and all of that, but oh my word, like how do I do this, right? And that then can be the big barrier. So you focus on things so practically and I, I'm looking forward to diving into that to give people some strategies. I wanna touch on because the stuff that you are talking about um, is not what most people hear their pediatricians talk about, right? Uh, yeah. And so I, I wanted to have you touch on really the difference between integrative or functional medicine and, and that approach to pediatric care and illness in kids compared to what conventional pediatricians do. Yeah. So when we're trained in medical school is we look at what is the issue. So if it's eczema. We are trained about which steroid to use on the skin in order to resolve the eczema. Mm -hmm. Whereas in functional or integrative medicine, we say, okay, this is an inflammatory issue. It's, you know, it's multifactorial, meaning you can, there can be environmental allergies, food. And so what we do in functional medicine is I, I have broken it down into five simple triggers of inflammation. Mm -hmm. So when we look at food, environmental allergies, environmental toxins, stress, mm -hmm. and infections. Mm -hmm. And some of the biggies, so within under the food category, we know and it's 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 well studied that with eczema in particular, about a third of the time it can be triggered by food. And the two big culprits can be dairy and eggs. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean it's all the time, but that's just, so that's one category. So we look at that. And then when we are looking at environmental allergies, you know, that's pretty conventional. We can do blood work to ascertain that. You can do a skin prick test. But the third category, the environmental toxins, is I, I, my medical school, I did not get any training in this. And so that's where we're looking also at things. You can have mold exposure, like the kind of mold that grows behind a wall in a water damaged building. You can have, that's where the, the herbicides, the pesticides, and that's where all of the different chemicals that we get exposed to in our environment come into play. And then when we're talking about infections, that can be bacteria, viruses, mm -hmm. fungi, parasites, and parasites are, are another biggie. I've had a couple of patients really in the last six or seven months that one of them, he was a classic asthma, eczema, and he had 
they, the family came back to me because I'd seen them when he was a baby when I was doing primary care. And a lot of his, his asthma and eczema were under good control, but they came back to see me because he wasn't sleeping. Mm. So we did a stool study and he had a parasite. Mm. So we treated the parasite and he, in the process, jumped to reading grades. Mm. And so that's, in medicine, we have to be careful not to say, just because we did that, this happened. Mm -hmm. And so it, yes, it could have been a timing coincidence, but the teacher actually called mom and said, I've never seen a child Mm. jump that quickly in their development for reading mm -hmm. and the mom really thought it was from treating the parasite mm -hmm. um, we have another boy who was on the spectrum who had a parasite and we treated him he we've not only been able to get rid of all of his asthma medications but his he used to cry every time he would read and he's now reading he will pick up a book and read mm -hmm. so it's it's going through that process of looking at where is their system inflamed? Because if your body is inflamed, if you have eczema, if you have uncontrolled asthma, which means you're maybe using your inhaler two times a week, mm -hmm. um, you or if you have constipation and the child isn't having a nice, easy bowel movement every day, that's inflammation in your body. And inflammation in your body means inflammation in your brain. Mm -hmm. And so that's harder for our neurotransmitters to do their work. So the neurotransmitter is gonna to bind to the receptor site on our cell, right? And it's gonna send a signal. And so all we do is we look at what's going on in the cellular environment, we decrease the inf inflammation, so we just allow the body to do its job the way that it's supposed to happen. Does that make sense? It does, and it's such a helpful way of just summarizing that approach of really looking at what's going on underneath the surface. Yes. You know, I, I always say to parents, if your kid has an acute illness, you know, mm -hmm. a strep throat, a broken arm, uh, you know, whatever the situation may be, then a conventionally trained pediatrician or physician is exactly who you want for that. Yes. And if you have these more, you know, uh, chronic, kinds of things that aren't going away with some of those, you know, more short-term treatments of an antibiotic or, you know, a steroid or a whatever it might be. These are things now that are going on long-term. You need a physician who's able to take a root level approach of, huh, why is it that this kid is having, you know, eczema or constipation or whatever in the first place. Let's just not resolve what the surface level symptom is. Let's really look at why that's happening and let's address it from, from that level, which can take a bit longer, right? I mean, this is more of a process, but yep. I always say to people, when we slow down and really work on the foundations, we actually speed up the progress because over time, what you get is, you know, a much better result. So, um, and, and I love that you talked about the five areas because that's so helpful to break that down. And I think for our listeners to understand that we're not just talking about food or just talking about infections or toxins. There's several different things, and that's a helpful way of conceptualizing that. Yeah. Um, so talk a bit, you, know, you, you really kind of got into how you approach looking at the root cause, so looking at those five areas. Um, let's talk about steps that are involved. So parents might be thinking now, okay, I get this. This makes sense. we got to look at these areas. How, how do you actually approach this? So how, what, what, do parent, what should parents expect in terms of what are the various types of steps to help a child who maybe has been struggling for quite a while um, with yeah. these kinds of physical or, or neurological types of issues? Yeah, so I like to break it down in, uh, I have seven steps that I do in my practice and I'm gonna go through those, but then I'm gonna help you listeners understand how to how to turn that into action at home awesome so the first thing is an assessment and in my book in my online course i go through how the difference between looking at a child's medical history from a conventional standpoint versus an integrative standpoint and these are where you start to see the patterns in the family mm. oh everybody's got dark circles under their eyes everybody's got bumps on their cheeks and bumps behind their arms mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, mom only has a bowel movement once a week. So that's what we're expecting. And so I like you to do an assessment first. And it, we, we can't know where we're going unless we know where we are. Mm. And do this, look at your child's health the same way you plan a vacation. Is you're going to, what do we want to do? Where do we want to be? I mean, you don't ever get in your car for a vacation unless you know exactly where you're going. Mm -hmm. So let's figure out what your coordinates are before you start so so looking at that first of all and then the second thing we do is understanding that inflammation is illness so whether it's mood swings behavior challenges and I personally always look at behaviors in kids as a signal for us adults to look at how they're processing information how they're processing food I really don't believe there are many kids who just do things intentionally to to irritate mom and dad right so I mean yes there's manipulation but I always yes. say you want to you want a child who's smart enough to manipulate us right that's right <laughs> There we have to ascertain that. So we want to understand that inflammation is illness. And we talk about, we in conventional medicine, we give them a diagnosis code. In functional medicine, we look at it at the overall picture. Mm -hmm. And then understanding the triggers of inflammation. And those are those five things that I just went through. I'll say them again. So it's food, environmental allergies, environmental toxins, infections and stress mm -hmm. and always remember stress can do just as much as any one of those other categories mm -hmm. and that includes what's going on between mom and dad mm -hmm. i mean i've had several families over the years that maybe marriage is really strained and instead of parents going to marriage counseling or looking at that piece of it is they're taking the kids from therapist to therapist to mm -hmm. therapist and so we always have to start with ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another factor. And then, so that's our third step in the overall step. So it's the assessment, understanding inflammation and illness, triggers of illness. And the fourth thing is gut health. Mm -hmm. And that's where we talk about, where we think about the microbiome, how many antibiotics have they been on. The fifth step is food. Mm -hmm. And that's where we really look at what we're going to be eating. The sixth step are supplements. I love to think that we can get everything we need from food. In my experience, we need to use some supplements to get us back to even playing ground. And then we have some foundational supplements that we need. Mm -hmm. And the, just the seventh step is the roadmap. So once we've figured out what we need to do and we get the child back into balance, what's our long term? What do we need going, going along? You know, what do we need for the long term? game mm -hmm. and so if i go i'll go into number five and i'll address that and a few things that i love for families to do and nicole i would also love to hear what you start with sure. but i always start with breakfast mm -hmm. and i say if we can take cereal and milk out of breakfast we're eliminating a lot of sugar mm -hmm. and can we do a green smoothie can we do eggs if your child tolerates eggs even or an organic piece of bacon or um, sausage or even a burger. I love to see the dads, like the big dads who think I'm going to be saying all this stuff. And I'm like, I'd rather you have a burger for breakfast than cereal. And they about fall off their chair. Right. A piece of salmon, wild caught sockeye salmon, mm -hmm. some leftover chicken from the night before. Mm -hmm. But we want to think about, we want your child to have fat a good clean, a clean fat, a clean protein, and then something colorful, so a fruit or a vegetable. And that's one of the reasons I love a green smoothie. And if we're starting off, and if your child does have any kind of gut issues, like constipation or loose stools or stomach aches, the green part of your smoothie, I prefer that to be something like lettuce, microgreens, or bok choy versus spinach, just because spinach can be a little a little bit hard on the gut at first and i know that sounds crazy to say we don't want to do a ton of spinach right away but if we can do that you know do a little bit of fruit in it maybe make the base of it water so that we're not getting a lot of sugar from the carton any of the other kind of milks whether it's hemp milk oat milk things like that oat milk um that would be great and then you want to have your fat and your protein mm -hmm. maybe some avocado again you could have an egg any kind of a piece of meat and if you're vegetarian or vegan chia seed flaxseed and hemp seed provide a really good amount of 
-hmm. vegetable or plant-based omega-3 fats. Mm -hmm. So that is where I start because we can do a huge decrease in the sugar load. Mm -hmm. We can get a lot of fat, we can get protein, and that's going to keep the kids full until lunchtime. Mm -hmm. It also, I, I like to start with breakfast too, because what we're doing then is setting kids up for success in school, you know, yes. or at home too. But that focus on protein and fat and getting rid of those processed carbs and sugars helps to stabilize the blood sugar so they have a better chance of being able to focus and to learn and to manage their emotions and behavior in school then. Um, so yeah, I, that, it's a great starting point. And it just sets the tone then I think for the whole rest of the day too. Absolutely. And if you can't, because a lot of the things that I do is I will pull dairy out of the kids diet and all we do is we say we're gonna take three weeks mm -hmm. in the back of my mind I'm going this is gonna I'm hoping this is more of a lifestyle right. but for the beginning it for the sake of the parents and the kids so that I don't lose them before mm -hmm. they before they get started we is we say just three weeks mm -hmm. and gradually we always do it gradually because the impact that dairy has on the body the kids can have a withdrawal type effect and yep. I learned that the hard way when I first started doing this we would mm -hmm. stop at cold turkey and moms would call me and say Sheila these kids are going <laughs> bizarre yeah and so, I'm sorry but we're <laughs> on the right track and keep going <laughs> a good thing but it's not I'm sorry that we did it so quickly and so now we gradually and I that's what I do in my online course is the first week we take dairy out of breakfast the second week out of lunch the third week out of dinner and snacks and if you can do that and if you can start to look at added sugar mm -hmm. so the American Heart Association has created guidelines for how much sugar kids should have and the amount of sugar, even in something like an, a vanilla yogurt, even it can be an organic yogurt, even coconut yogurt, uh -huh. it can have up to three or four teaspoons of sugar a day. And for a, a, a young school age child, that's the amount of added, they're not supposed to have much more than that for a day. So before they've even left the house, if you had one of those yogurts, you've maxed out your sugar. Mm -hmm. So just, just really thinking about the added sugars and things. And I'm not a big one. I don't love to have people scrutinizing packages. Mm -hmm. I do at first though want moms to be looking at the sugar content. Mm -hmm. And then I want you to be looking, I mean, if we can, if we're doing less and less packaged foods, then we have to do less label reading. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, really, I think sugar is such a great starting point because when we focus on trying to get processed sugar out, it automatically takes care of removing so many other things that we don't want to be including. So it, it's a great place to start. Yeah. And it is, it's funny. I actually don't talk that much about sugar is I just talk more about decreasing the packaged foods. Yeah. So that it's, it, it, and it automatically takes care of it. Yeah. Yeah, just that idea of shifting to more real food, you know, what, yeah. the, what we call whole food or real food, stuff that is actually how it occurs, you know, yeah. in nature, real fruits and vegetables, real whole grains, real, you know, meats and seafoods and stuff like that, and moving away from some of the, um, the packaged options. And, you know, if you're listening to that and that feels really overwhelming, just know there are more options than ever before in convenient sort of packaged yeah. ways to get clean foods. That's one of the benefits of it being now as opposed to when we were talking with families about this even eight, 10 years ago, you know, there were not a lot of companies who, who were doing things like this. Now you can go to many of the mass grocery stores or places online and you can find um, more packaged convenient options that yeah. are conscious of better ingredients, lower sugar, all of that. So I never want, like when we start talking about moving towards whole foods and things like that, I don't ever want people to shut down to the idea that, oh my gosh, I don't have time, like I can't do that. There are lots of ways to do that. And, and going back to what you said earlier, Sheila, about you know, just take some simple small steps to start. Like really any step you take in that direction is going to be a positive thing for your child. So don't not do it just because you think you can't go 100%, you know, all in. Any step that you take is going to support your child in this way. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And with what I alluded to earlier, the Environmental Working Group mm -hmm. has a list and it's called the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. So if you are going and in your grocery store, maybe you don't have all the organic options or some things are really expensive, you can have this, there's an app that you can get, you can have it right on your phone and go, mm, okay, if the strawberries, so strawberries are one of the foods that really absorb pesticides. Mm -hmm. So if they're super expensive in the organic realm and maybe we don't wanna do that, just skip the strawberries mm -hmm. and go to something like an orange or uh, you know, one of the things that has a rind on it that is going to be less, it's going to have absorbed less pesticides. Mm -hmm. And you can decrease your pesticide exposure by up to 92% by following their guidelines. Mm -hmm. And as you see every day, Nicole, the, the studies are pretty clear that kids with, the high, with pesticide exposures that are higher have higher rates of ADHD. Mm -hmm. And within a week, we know that of kids going on clean food, their urine will clear from these pesticides. And so it's really, I always love to talk about that because just as you said, doing a few simple steps can really make a big difference. That's really powerful information that, you know, a 90 plus percent reduction. Right? That, yeah. I mean, that, that's powerful. And I think, you know, such a practical thing that, that a parent right now who's listening to this can do. Go to the Environmental Working Group, download that Dirty Dozen Clean 15 list. And even if you just focus there, because it's true, the research is getting even clearer. I mean, stronger over time. It feels like every week I get something in one of my research feeds about new connections between pesticide and chemical exposure and ADHD, autism, seizure issues, you know, allergies, the whole thing. And that that's such a, a, a simple step that we can take. Um, I also like going to one of your five core things about um, you know, some of the environmental toxins too that, that come into our body in the form of like personal care products or, you know, things that we use to clean. I always recommend to families, you know, the Environmental Working Group has great guide they put out every year for clean sunscreens and, you know, all of that kind of stuff, lotions and different things. It's a great resource for just looking at products that can help reduce our overall toxicity in terms of what we're using in our home, what we're using on our kids' bodies. Um, it, it really is a good guide for that, I think. Yes, yeah. And a couple of my favorites, too, are when you talk, when it comes to cleaning products, vinegar and water cleans just about everything, and baking soda can clean your bathtub. Right. And right there, you're going to save money on your cleaning products, and you're not going to be exposing your kids to all of the, mm -hmm. the chemicals that are in the strong cleaning products. And the, the other way that I, I've heard it, I heard it at a conference explained this way, and I love this. So we breathe about 10,000 liters of air a day, so we want to make sure we have clean air. We drink, you know, adult one to two liters of water a day. So we definitely want clean water. And it's more than just the, the refrigerator filter. And you may have your favorites. I have a couple of the filters that I prefer. And that's another way. And then the third thing is food, right? That we're eating three meals plus a day. And then the last are all of those things that we have on our, our bodies and I had one case right out of residency and it was another it was a terrible the worst eczema one of the worst cases I've ever seen and I didn't figure it out but it was the dermatologist who figured it out that it was the Glade plugins that was triggering this girl's ah, mm -hmm. and so that's we just we we have to be sleuths and that's what I always tell parents is that I'm going to give you this list of things that can be the triggers and often it's the parents who figure it out. Yeah. So information is power. We only have a couple minutes left, but I wanna to touch on something related to that, just um, that I know comes up a lot in working with families or even with other professionals. I know that there's some people listening right now that are going, yeah, I get that, but look, 
you know, nobody else in the family seems sensitive to this. So I, you know, I use the same bath soap on all my kids or I use the same cleaning products, you know, but I've got this one child who's got this terrible eczema and these, you know, ADHD and, and other issues. But, you know, why don't all of my kids have problems then? If, it, if, it, if it's the food or it's the, the things in the environment or whatever, how come all of us aren't walking around with all of these issues? Can you just speak to that for a minute? Yeah, absolutely. So we are all, we all have different genetics, you know, and we have different genetic SNPs are what they're called. And so we metabolize things differently based on what our genetic makeup is. And we also know that it's the environment that our cells are in that determines if these genetic SNPs are turned on or off. Mm -hmm. And so that could have been whatever was happening with mom in pregnancy, with the baby when they're young, what's happening with their gut flora, were they breastfed, bottle fed, were they a C-section, were they a vaginal delivery? So there are many different variables and it's even things like celiac disease. You know, two people may be predisposed to it, but one person may get it because maybe there was a big stressor, maybe they had a viral illness. A lot of people realize that, I mean, we know this in the medical world, but with diabetes type one, that's another one that we know often the kids will get a viral illness before they get diagnosed with it. Mm -hmm. And so there are certain triggers that will turn some of these genes on that are not going to allow us to detoxify and to get these things out of our system as easily as someone else will. And so it's really important not to discount it or discount what's going on just because it's only one person in the family. Mm -hmm. And those kids are like the canaries in the coal mine is their bodies are more sensitive and they're alerting us to the fact that you know, these chemicals really are not good for us. And if we're exposed to them for a long enough period of time, everybody's going to start to have some subtle changes but it may happen so subtly that you don't realize, wow, I actually have a headache every day. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll use myself as an example with this is I, when I was a kid, I had to take antibiotics for six months. I used to get these kidney infections mm -hmm. and I never had any problems with my kidney again. But then as I was starting medical school, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, mm -hmm. which is an autoimmune thyroid condition. Well, they told me at the time at the student health center that it's the best thing to get because all you have to do is take a medication for the rest of your life. I had no idea about food at that point in time. Right. But then after I went through all my training and through the integrative fellowship, I said, you know what, I'm going to take gluten out of my diet. Mm -hmm. And I took gluten out and it was like somebody took a bag off of my head. Mm -hmm. I could think more clearly. I didn't have energy slumps after I ate. And all of a sudden, my GI system worked, and I didn't have a stomach ache after I ate. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't have celiac disease, but I have a gluten sensitivity. And I am pretty, I really think mine was partially from the antibiotics. And then mm -hmm. glyphosate, which is in Roundup, that really came, they started to use it a lot more in the 90s. And it was, and, and you know, in the late 80s and in college, what did I do is I ate a lot of pizza, I drank beer, and I, you can see the difference in my face when I was in college. And, you know, unfortunately, it wasn't for years later, later till I figured it out. But that's the whole thing. And there, you know, so, so that's an example of not being able to tolerate something. And it's just the timing of it. And I think it was just built up over time. And I wish I had known to go off of gluten right when I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's because I probably would have, I could have stopped it in its tracks mm -hmm. um, or potentially could have. Yeah. So I, I hope that explains it, but it's, it has a lot to do with our genetics and SNPs and how we detoxify and clear things from our system. Mm -hmm. I think that's really helpful because that's often something that comes up that, that people ask about or it can be a barrier to people really moving forward with things um, because they just think it couldn't be that big a deal or whatever. And, and I think that often there's a child in the family who's the identified patient when families come to me or come to you. And as you start to get to know the family, things start to come out about what's going on with other kids or with the parents too. And it's like, actually, 
probably everybody in the family or more than just this child has some of these issues going on because they do share a certain amount of genetics and environmental exposure and whatever, but it tends to be one kid in the family who really is having the more severe issues and that draws people's attention to it, but it doesn't mean that there aren't issues going on in everybody else in the family too. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's so, where the fun of this is that everybody gets better. That's exactly right. And taking that family approach, that's exactly right. Where what we talk to parents about doing for this one child, when you implement it as a family, suddenly everybody just feels better and functions better, which is great. Yeah. Um, I want to, um, I, we could talk all day um, about this. I'm, I'm like realizing, oh, the time is going down here. So I want to make sure that um, you share with people where they can get more information um, about you. I know you've got lots of resources online, a book. So where, where can people find yeah. you online? Talk, talk about your book for a minute. Absolutely. So my book, it's, it's on Amazon. It's called Healthy Kids, Happy Moms. And it's a step-by-step -step guide to improving many common childhood illnesses. And then my online course is called Seven Steps to Healthy Kids, Happy Moms. And you can, if you go to the, my website is SheilaKilbane.com. And we have links to all of those from the website. Mm -hmm. And I do, we do have a lot of out of state families. You just, you have to come to Charlotte at least once in order for me to be able to see you. Um, and the goal is to have enough resources that you can really start to make a big difference. And for, I'd say 60 to 70% of kids mm -hmm. using the resources that I have online is going to be all that you need. And then it's only the more, mm -hmm. the, the the more severe cases that are going to need a lot more in-depth work, look at the gut and labs and things like that. Yeah, great resources, things that I refer um, families to often. So definitely check those out. Um, Sheila, thank you so much for taking the time to um, be with us today. I know that people found this incredibly helpful. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for doing this, Nicole. All right, everybody. We will see you next time for our next episode of The Better Behavior Show.